Okay, here we are. Mark chapter 16 and verse number one. Don't run off, Steve. Now I got to have him. <laughs> He's coming back. <laughs> Sick <of> him. <laughs> okay, here we are. Mark chapter 16 and verse number one. I looked up all four, and I'll be reading these in the, in the jail because I want the men to recognize that this is resurrection time. I know that Brother Ross, he's our chaplain out at uh, Price Daniels, and he was out there, kicked their service off this morning. Thank you, Brother Ross. I mean, he's got like 1,300 people to pick from there and to work on and love on, and he's bringing the resurrection message to them there early this morning. And so here we are. We just want to read this and let you see the scriptural context of what Jesus actually did. It's in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So here it is. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. So they got up early. They said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. So they knew they couldn't get in without some help. Somebody had done rolled it off. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were, I love this word. Would you say it with me? And they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. And would you say these words with me? He is risen. He is not here. Don't you love that? Woo! He's not on the cross. He's not in the tomb. Whoa! He's not here. Behold the place where they laid. He said, come on in here and look at his coffin where he was actually laid. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. I mean, they're, they're scared. They can't believe. Who, sees, who goes to the graveyard and sees the, the grave open? Yeah, that's why he's called the first fruits. <laughs> yeah. And they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Because <clears throat> this dead man is living. Woo. And to see that. Mm. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So if you come this morning and you're full of the devil, Jesus come this morning to cast those demons out. Woo! And to set us free. Isn't he wonderful? And she went and told them that they had been with, with him. And they mourned and wept. Lord, thank you for your reading of your word. Thank you for the hope we have in your resurrection power. And we love you because the grave burst open to let others see that you were not there. You were risen. And for this, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, in light of the resurrection, I would like to take you over to St. John chapter 12. And we're going to read just a few verses here, starting in verse number 20. Because his, his resurrection has so much power. Our Sunday school lesson this morning that Brother Ben taught was, was so precious. How he linked together the, the woman that had the two sons. And uh, the creditors had come to take them away. And she runs to the prophet and said, my, my husband who was a prophet is dead. And now the creditors have come and I have nothing to pay them. So they're going to take my sons. And brought that out, how that the oil was like Christ being uh, at Gethsemane and being pressed. It, it was a precious, a precious, precious Sunday school lesson. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Ben and Chelsea was working on that. She would have probably showed the little film if they'd have had the opportunity back there. But they showed it here and it was, it was just wonderful. But here we are. <clears throat> And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now, this is when Jesus, just before his 
uh, going to Calvary. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We've heard about him. We want to see him. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so he's, he's getting them, he's trying to get them ready for his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's telling them, it's time. My time has come. I just got a few hours and then I'm going to be on the cross. I'm going to be in the grave and then I'm going to be resurrected. He said, the, the, the time has come. Look at verse number 24. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Most of us here have been around farming sometime. And you know anything you plant, you don't go out there in three or four days and find that seed and, uh, and that's what you get back. Do you go take what you planted? No. no. You, you plant that seed and that seed dies, and, but it sprouts in the process and up comes a brand new likeness. Yeah. If it's wheat or okra or squash or whatever you planted, it's just good to see that, hey, in a little while, give it a few weeks, that's going to come up, make a plant, and it's going to make more produce. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground, out of the alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Jesus is likening this to what he's fixing to do. He's fixing to die. He's fixing to be planted, but he's going to come up, resurrected Savior. <clears throat> He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Jesus is getting ready to go to Gethsemane where the pressure is put on it. Remember, and it was so neat how uh, Brother Ben brought that out that, that as he was pressed, his last prayer, his press in this great drops of blood flowed out of him. His, the weight of our sins were so heavy upon him. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. So he's totally man, he's totally God, but look at the man part. What would we, what would we, if we're looking at the torture that he's fixing to go through, look at his prayer. Lord, can you save me from this? Is there any way out? That's, that's the flesh man. And then here comes the spiritual man speaking. But for this cause came I unto this hour. I'm here for this very reason. <clears throat> Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Do you know who the prince of this world is? That's the devil. And Jesus says, I'm going to cast him off his throne. And for the first time, humanity would have opportunity for supernatural salvation. More than just joining a church, more than just shaking a preacher's hand, more than when people ask you if you're saved, you give them a denomination. I go to such and such. But the, the supernatural fact that you recognize, Jesus has washed me as white as snow. He's taken my sins away, and I have become something that I've never been before. I've become a new creature in Christ. Woo! He said, I'm going to do something. I am going to cast him out. Woo! Now, Rebecca read the scripture where the Jesus triumphed gloriously. He showed, he put a show on. <laughs> you know why? Right in front of them. You think death has stopped me? You think the grave has stopped me? You think the cross has stopped me? Woo! He triumphed gloriously over them in it. One more scripture, and then we'll go into this, into this passage I want to talk to you about. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth... If I go to the cross, something's going to happen. I will draw how many? All men. All men. Now he sees, 
He's real prejudiced. Jesus is real prejudiced. He sees two kinds of people. He sees the lost and he sees the found. <laughs> and if you're lost, he's after you. He loves you. He wants to bring you in. You may be crooked as a serpent, but if you come to Jesus, you'll be straight as an arrow. Woo! That's what he does for us. He cleans us up, washes us, and lets us become something we've never been before. I was talking to a young boy. I've been teaching him was in the, in the pens Friday, uh, working on a bunch of cattle, about, I don't know, about three or 400 head. There was a bunch of them. Anyway, they was helping me. One of them was five years old, one of them was eight. And so, man, they know, I mean, they're little chatter, 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 so sweet. I said, have y'all ever learned a scripture? So I was talking to him about John three sixteen. How many could say it with me? For God, that he is only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever lasting life. <laughs> well, they said, well, we've been running some out of Psalms and Proverbs. I said, that's good, but you need this and out of John. <laughs> you know why? And I, if I be lifted up in our conversation, if we lift up Jesus in our lifestyle, if we lift up Jesus in our language, you know what? We're born, we born, we think about filthy words, curses, and stuff like that. That's, that's the way we're born. That's just our nature. But when we get saved, uh, our mouth cleans up. Amen. Yeah, and that old language has to go for the new language can come. Amen. I just love when you're shouting now. Woo! I don't want to be the old language no more. New creatures, yes, by the grace of God. And so I want, I want to zero in on one scripture here out of this passage we just read, and that's verse number 27. And talk to you about this. And I'm going to hurry. Uh, you don't have to worry about missing your meal because it's on the stove at the back. <clears throat> Here we go. Now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And here's why. For this cause came I unto this hour. So what he's saying to us is that there was a reason. The cause, the word cause means there's a reason for doing this. Why? I was shoeing a little mare the other day and she was throwing a fit so I had her in, in, a, in a little shoe stall and she got down, turned upside down, everything else, but when she come out she had a shoe on that foot. So I let her out, got her back in there, tied her back up and uh, she went. And she throwed another fit and laid down in, in that shoe stall and the other foot stuck out and I'm nailed a shoe on it. There was a reason I was doing it. She was getting crippled on so I had to keep riding her sort of, come on now. And so if you go to going, Ooh, I know Jesus is working on you. Don't, don't get all skin up now. <laughs> Just know that there's a reason. There's a cause. You're not here by accident. Nobody is. We're here because God gave us another opportunity to freshen our walk with him. And that happens because be Cause, C A U S, because of his resurrection power. And so the, the thought, the, there's three things I want to talk to you about. The first one is intentional planting, that he actually come to the cross intentionally. You know, the greatest grief I knew as a young minister was to think that they took him against his will. That I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It broke my heart. I, I couldn't get the fact that he came because he loved us. He came because he wanted to come. He came for this cause. His reason to be here on the earth was to go to the cross of Calvary. His reason was to empty the tomb. And his reason was to arise the third day a resurrected Savior and to pour into us a hope that makes us not ashamed. I am proud to serve this risen Savior. Woo! I was so terribly lost <laughs> and he so graciously forgave me of my sins. So would you say that word with me? Intentional, Intentional. planting. That little mare, when she backed out of the shoe and stock, had two shoes, one on each front foot. I don't know if she would have lived if I'd have nailed them on the back because she was, <laughs> she thought I had completely done her wrong. And so the cause, the, the cause is here. Jesus actually died because he loved us. 
He talks about it in verse 24. Verily I said, do you accept a corn of wheat falling to the ground and die? It abideth alone. My granddad called my dad one day, or he called me and he said, Cub, he called me, my dad, they called him Bear. They called, he, my granddad called me Cub. So he said, Cub, I want to ask you a question. I said, okay. What is it, granddad? Well, he didn't ask my dad. <laughs> he knew dad would just kind of say, well, we'll plant it. He said, I don't know if your dad has planted his cotton yet. Because <laughs> we farmed one of his places. There where we lived was his. And so I said, granddad, we have not planted the cotton yet. He said, well, would you tell your dad something for me? <laughs> I said, sure. He said, tell your daddy it won't come up in the sack. <laughs> so when I saw dad, dad was laughing. He said, yeah. He said, we'll plan it when it gets ready. It's not time yet. But those words, have, did you know that Jesus, if he hadn't have died, we'd be in hell, all of us. No hope, but he was planted intentionally in the grave to bring hope to us. And so that intentionality is what we must have. In, in Luke chapter 10, it talks about Mary and Martha. And you know the conflict they had. Martha's getting dinner ready. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Her intentionality was noted by Christ that she has chosen the best thing. The best thing you can do is not get dinner ready. The best thing you can do is go to church. That's, that's what she's saying. Dinner, you're not going to die if you miss a meal. Woo! Now, I wouldn't get hungry with you. <laughs> yeah. But it's not lethal. You're going to be all right. Isn't that crazy that the, that the watch should stop the church? Oh, it's 12 o'clock, preacher. What difference does that make? Are we going to monitor the gospel with, the, with the, well, if you don't quit by 12, I'll get up and walk out. They're going to stop you. They're going to rope you. They're going to put you in the shoe. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so intentionally, what's she doing? Instead of cleaning the house, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's hearing stuff she never heard before. And it's opening up such a way for her. In John chapter 12 and verse number three, this same little lady, she intentionally gets her pound of ointment out. And she goes to the feet of Jesus and she wipes his feet. And friends, without intentionality, you'll never go to heaven or me. Nobody is there by accident. You must intend to go. And to intend to go, you must get ready. And so she's ready. She walks into the room. She knows he's not too far from death. She understood that somehow in her mind. And so here she is anointing the feet of Jesus and takes her long hair and wipes his feet with the hair from her head as she weeps and cries over him. And he says, she has done this against my burial. Woo, that's foresight, intentionally, on purpose. In Luke chapter five, verses eight and 11, we won't read those, but just for the sake of you remembering, Peter is a little bit slow in paddling out to take the fishing trip. He's been fishing all night long. The Lord used his boat. And so he tells him, he says, Peter, if you'll launch out into the deep for a great drought, Peter says, Lord, we're tired. We fished all night last night. Nevertheless, at thy word. Sometimes that's the way we are. We, we know God spoke to us, but we're, we're not real intentional. But Peter, he says, okay, you know what? You said it, we're going to paddle out there. So they row out there a little piece, and all of a sudden they let their, their net down, and the net gets full. So he looks back at his buddy and says, there's more than my boat will hold. So they fill his boat up. They bring the other boat. They fill it up, and Peter looks up, and he says, this is nothing but God. And so he jumps out of the boat and runs to Jesus that's standing on the bank and falls down before him at his knees and says, oh God, I'm a sinner. That, that intentionality is what brings change. If you just go to church, did you know people can go to church and still go to hell? And so what he said, be intentional. What are we here for? We're here. Do you want to go to the table and not eat? Don't invite me over because if you do, I'm going to call me. I'm going to eat with you. <laughs> Anything you can get down, I'll get some of it. <laughs> we, we ate about four o'clock at one of the ranches the other day, and uh, Sonny was telling Abel, Abel, he's laughing. He says, Dan, Dad, don't like, uh, what is that stuff? Lasagna. Yeah, lasagna. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if I had to eat, that'd be the last thing. But at four o'clock, you know what? It looked like a chicken fried steak. <laughs> Something happens. You start at 4 o'clock in the morning. You work at 4 o'clock that evening. You can, you can eat stuff that, you're not, that you usually wouldn't eat. 
Man, I got me a big chunk of that and I wolfed it down. Just, it didn't matter what it tastes like. And I said, I'm hungry. Can you imagine what was happening if you're so hungry to get to the altar that the preacher didn't even get to preach? You just run down there and said, you know what? My flesh says don't go, but my spiritual man said I'm so hungry for a touch of God. And intentionally, I come today to meet Jesus. Don't get mad at the preacher. You get mad at the devil and say, I'm going I'm to show you something. I'm intentionally going all the way to Calvary to meet Christ. Woo, hallelujah. I thought somebody going to be shouting, but now. Glory. The scripture says in Luke chapter 5, verse number 11, and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and they followed him. Why? That's intentionality. We're going to follow Jesus. The second thing I want to talk to you about, and I just have three points. The second thing is uncontrollable sprouting. The Lord put something in the seed that's so awesome. And I hear my dad, my, my dad had great big, huge hands, but he was so tender. With the, He'd plant the cotton, and it's all around our house there. And he'd go out there and he'd get down on his knees after three or four days and he'd scratch down in there and see if that little cotton, I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't dig it up. He'd just dig, I could see his big old finger. I mean, his hand was twice as big as mine. He'd, be, he'd go down there like that and he'd start scratching the top off of those seed and all of a sudden he'd say, Woo! Look at there. And under the ground would be that brand new shoot. I mean, that thing had started coming up. And friends, they killed Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But I just want to tell you, there was an uncontrollable sprouting in Christ. Uncontrollable. He is coming out of the grave. Death cannot stop him. The grave cannot stop him. The burden of sin cannot stop him. And friends, that's why we have hope. Your sins and mine are horrible. And so we take it to Christ and he covers it up and clears us, gives us a clear account and gives us an opportunity to walk the rest of our life like him. Not to go back and dabble where we come from, but to become the new creatures that's recorded in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have, have passed away. So this uncontrollable sprouting is what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. They couldn't keep him down. Woo! Matthew, or verse, verse number 24 of our text. We're, we're back there in St. John 12, verse number 24. And thank you so much, Sister Leatherwood, for helping us. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, what happens? If that seed disintegrates, what happens? It germinates. And look, but if it die, what does it do? It bringeth forth how much? Much, much fruit. Woo! And so that little seed you planted, when that cotton stalk is about that tall and got bowls all over it, there'll be lots of seed in that one plant. Yeah, reproducing. And so he's asking us to recognize that un controllable sprouting of Christ. In Mark, Matthew chapter 27 in verse number 50 <clears throat> Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice he yielded up the ghost and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and all of these have such powerful moves of what happened. Now we can go to the holies of holies. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. That's when Jesus died. You know why? Because they're saying something, you heard of the paradigm swing, we swung all the way out of the law into the New Testament righteousness of Christ. Oh, glory. Look at the next verse. And the graves were opened what is this? What caused this? Uncontrollable sprouting. The graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. That's when Jesus, when did they arise? Verse 53 tells it. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Wouldn't it be wild if you went down to the donut shop this morning and there was somebody standing there that had been dead about 20 years and they said, hello. How you doing? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> they came out of the graveyard of the resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Can you imagine them dead people walking through? You see, 
the film industry thought they really had something when they talked about the night of the living dead. Well, this is the day of the living righteous. They burst out of the grave just because Jesus was resurrected. Friends, this is not just a story. This is the reality of the uncontrollable sprouting of Christ. When he come out of the grave, the saints come out with him. And say, well, preacher, what happened to him? I don't know. When you get to heaven, ask Jesus. <laughs> hey! Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 24. We're talking about there was a cause. The cause was intentional planting, uncontrollable sprouting. Acts chapter 2, verse number 24. Whom God raised up. Don't you like that? They put him in the grave, but guess what? God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible. I love this scripture because when they planted him, it was impossible for him not to rise again, Sister Jean. He's coming out of the grave. Impossible for him to be holden with it. What a powerful scripture. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse number eight. I love this one too. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to get a piece of candy away from your brother or your sister and just before you get there, they're stuffing the whole thing in their mouth and they, they chew it about twice and they go, Ooh. oh, I see Sue, you're talking about, oh, you yes, Sue did it. <laughs> well, y'all are probably the only two in the building. No, how many, we're all guilty, huh? Go, 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 go. <laughs> yeah. Look what happens. Are they trying to get the last biscuit away from you? And it's like, whoop, whoop, all of a sudden, and swallow hard. Look what Jesus did. He swallowed. What did he do? He swallowed up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Friends, if your sins has brought you to a crumbling existence, come to Jesus. He'll swallow down all of your death and he'll bring victory and he'll bring life to you. And that crumbled life will be put back together. He can take a leg and a piece of an ear and build you a whole lifestyle out of it. He'll forgive you, set you free, and intentionally sprout you to rise up out of the grave of sin to live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He swallowed up death in victory. I don't know if you ever heard the story about Pharaoh, but Pharaoh is sitting there and he's, asked, he's looking at Moses and Aaron. And he's saying, well, if your God is so big, I haven't seen nothing that proves that to me. So Aaron throws his rod down and it turns into a snake. It's not one of those little grass snakes because that's the same snake that Moses ran from. It was probably one of those that stands up like that. Have you ever seen that king cobra whenever his neck widens out? And he's looking you right in the eye and he said, if I can't bite you, I'll spit on you. That's the way the devil is. Friends, if he can't actually get his teeth into you, he spits some of his poison out on your life. But something happened. Aaron throws his rods down and so the magicians, the magicians, they're like this. This is, huh. so they throw their rod down and guess what? Their rod became snakes too. But something awesome happened that talks about what Jesus did here. Aaron's rod, the one that Moses carried, guess what it did? It started running up there and catching them other snakes and swallowing them. You know what it's showing? It's showing what our Savior did. Our Savior supernaturally swallowed down death in victory. And just in a few minutes, friends, there's not a snake left but Aaron's snake. And he reached down and picks it up, and he's got the rod of Moses in his head again. Woo! Victory! You know why? Friends, here's the victory we have. Jesus actually swallowed up death in victory for us uncontrollable sprouting. <clears throat> In Colossians 2 and 15, this is a scripture that Rebecca read and having spoiled principalities and powers. That means he went in there and got their strength away from them and made a shoe of them openly. He said, you don't have nothing. I am king of kings, lord of lords. Woo! I am the resurrected Savior. 
And I love this word, triumphing over them in it. Friends, what we're getting to see this morning and rejoice over again 2,000 years later is the Lord of triumph. Woo! He's not this little muckle down deal that's, oh no, I don't know if I can stand to be a Christian or not. But he's the triumphant Lord that says, I want to lead you far enough out past yourself that you'll be the new fresh believer by the grace of God. And then the third thing, You didn't think I was going to get down to that, did you? The third thing is, not only was there intentional planning and uncontrollable sprouting, but there was also eternal production. Friends, what Jesus promised in John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have something. Everlasting life. That's what he produces. If you come to Christ, he offers you the opportunity to live for him until we get all the way to the portals of glory. Sister, I heard your prayer. Sister Nord, man, she can't wait to be in the presence of our Savior. Thank you so much for praying over the blood of Jesus. And what a joy to know that he gives us eternal production. He gives us life. We sang the song this morning, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fears are gone. Because I know he's in control of the future. Have you looked at your future lately? Have you noticed that America has changed? That Texas is not the same as it used to be? That there's all kinds of crumbling things going on? And people have bought into some of the most ferocious lies that's out there. And still Jesus is in the eternal production stage. He said, if you'll come to me, I'll do something. And here's his words in verse number 32 of our text. St. John 12 and verse number 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'm going to do something. I will draw all men unto me. And friends, that's what what this service is about. Wherever you are, wouldn't you like to take take a step closer? to Christ, be drawn into his presence and say, Lord, I just, I just want to turn my all over to you today in the wonderful name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37, we won't read that, but if you know anything about that passage of scripture, 3,000 souls were saved. Why? I and I, if I be lifted up. In, in chapter 3 and 4, in chapter 3, the man that's been, had the palsy his whole life is healed as John and Peter go into the temple. And because of that, in, in chapter 4, it tells how many men was saved just over that one, that one healing. 5,000 people Men, don't, don't talk about the women and the children who were all so saved too, but 5,000 men give their hearts to the Lord. What's he saying? You lift up the name of Jesus. He's going to be there to bring salvation and eternal life to us together. Would our musicians come back to this instruments please some of you and I want to give you an opportunity today to come around these altars. We've talked to you about uh, if, if you're struggling with something, of course, today we would love to take time and pray for you and love on you. And if, if not, just come and, and reiterate the fact that, Lord, I know you saved me for a reason. And I want to follow you. If you're intentional, let me be intentional. If you're uncontrollable, let me be uncontrollable touching other people and if you give eternal salvation let me lead people into this beautiful walk of eternal salvation would you stand with me how many would love to join me with this thought that there is a cause there's a reason for me to be a Christian and I'm saying today this Easter morning that Lord I'm asking you help me to take my stand with God and walk forward in the name of Jesus These altars are open. If you don't want to pray at the altar, you're welcome to pray at your seat. But would you come in with this thought in your mind? There is a cause, and that cause is I want to see people find Jesus as their personal Savior. Come this morning and let the Lord speak fresh into your life. Mm -hmm.